Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Kazu Watanabe. I'm the Deputy Director of Film at Japan Society in New York and one of the programmers behind Japan Cuts Festival of New Japanese Film. I'm very happy to welcome everyone to our live stream event for the closing night of this year's virtual edition of the festival. I'm joined by my colleagues and fellow festival programmers, Amber Noe and Joel Neville Anderson. And we're all very excited uh, to close the festival out with the jury and recipient of our inaugural Obayashi Prize, uh, which is presented as part of the brand new Next Generation section of the festival. Uh, just before we got on live, we, we found out that uh, the closing day today for Japan Cuts coincides with the theatrical opening of Obayashi's final film, Labyrinth of Cinema in Japan. So it feels extra appropriate that we can present the Obayashi Prize today. Uh, it's a bit of serendipity that carries over from the coincidence that Obayashi passed away on the day the film was originally supposed to open in Japan uh, on April 10th before it was forced to shut down because of coronavirus. Uh, so we feel his presence especially strongly today. For those of you watching on our YouTube live stream, uh, welcome and thank you for joining us. Uh, first, we'll introduce our esteemed jury and then have them read their collective statement regarding their decision uh, for the Obayashi Prize. Then we'll have a conversation between all the programmers and the Obayashi Prize recipient, Anshul Chauhan, uh, director of the film Kantora. Please feel free to participate by leaving uh, comments and questions uh, in the chat. We announced the winner earlier this week on Tuesday uh, to give time for people to watch the film. So I hope you all had a chance to see it. Uh, before then, uh, Amber uh, will provide some brief background about the Next Generation section and the Obayashi Prize. Thank you, Kazu. Uh, as you know, Next Generation is a brand new edition to Japan Cuts. It is a section dedicated to spotlighting uh, emerging filmmakers who create uh, independently produced narrative feature films. Uh, and we are very excited this year to be able to introduce this section, which we originally were planning before coronavirus. Um, this section is meant to further encourage the development of Japanese independent cinema. Uh, in thinking about the name for the prize of Next Generation, it didn't take us long to unanimous, unanimously uh, cons cons bring to a consensus on uh, honoring director Nobuhiko Obayashi, who passed away earlier this year in April, as Kazu mentioned. The, prize for the Obayashi for the next generation section is not meant to uh, award the recipient who most closely resembles the inimitable filmmaker. Instead, it is meant to, in his honor, share his spirit of freedom, innovation, creativity, and his love for cinema. Director Obayashi left us with the following words of encouragement for the next generation of filmmakers to smile, to live, and to make tomorrow a little better than today. That is why I make films. So you guys continue to write, okay? Uh, so I'd like to take this time to thank uh, Kyoko and Chigumi Obayashi for offering this opportunity and for helping us establish this new tradition of the festival. Thank you. Uh, now, without further ado, I'd like to introduce Joel, who will introduce the jury members of the Next Generation section. Thank you, Amber, and hello, everyone. It's my great pleasure to introduce the prestigious members of the Next Generation Jury who determine the recipient of the inaugural Obayashi Prize and are joining us virtually from Japan and Europe. This is really a dream team of Japanese cinema professionals and we're so very grateful for their willingness to serve as jury members. Uh, so going in alphabetical order, uh, Momoko Ando is a film director uh, and her debut feature is writer director Kakera, A Piece of Our Life received wide acclaim in Japan and international festivals. In 2012, she published her first novel, which she then adapted into 0.5 millimeter, one of the best films of the decade, in my opinion, which we we're very proud to premiere at Japan Cuts. 0.5 millimeter stars her sister Sakura Ando and received numerous awards in Japan and abroad, including the Shanghai International Film Festival Best Director Award, 
Uh, and Ando is also the representative director of the movie theater Kinema M in Kochi Prefecture, where she currently resides. Julian Ross is a programmer at Locarno Film Festival and International Film Festival Rotterdam. He's assistant professor at Leiden University Center for the Arts and Society and mentor at the Netherlands Film Academy. He's co-curator of the exhibition More Than Cinema, Motoharo Junichi and Keiichi Tanami at Pioneer Works in Brooklyn, uh, and co-editor of the book Japanese Expanded Cinema and Intermedia, Critical Texts of the 1960s. Uh, and Julian is also currently in the UK where it's 2 a.m. in the morning right now. So uh, <laughs> deep gratitude for sacrificing some sleep to join us. So thank you. Uh, Miyuki Takamatsu is the founding CEO of Freestone Productions, uh, one of the only firms providing services both in Japan and overseas. Freestone Productions is involved in everything from production to sales, PR and distribution, both in Japan and internationally. With her team, she's busy with inter international PR for the French Film Festival, the Kyoto Film Festival, and the Tokyo International Film Festival. And she's also a producer of the film 10 Years Japan, which we were so happy to screen at the festival last year. So welcome Momoko-san, Julian-san, and Yuki-san. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. Uh, so thank you very much for introducing us, Joel. Um, I would like to start uh, from myself. Uh, I'm very, very happy to present this uh, precious award. And now uh, Momoko-san will be speaking out in Japanese to state for our decision and Julian uh, will be speaking out in English. So Momoko-san, uh, please. Okay. <laughs> ah, okay, so I'm gonna speak in Japanese. Nippon wo fukumu sekai no eiga gyokai ga kiki teki na henka ni chokumen shite iru ima. Next Generation Competition Bumon wa wareware shinsain ni Nippon eiga kai no mirai o misueru toyu positive na iyoku o kaki tatte mashita. Jushou sakuhin wa Obayashi kantoku ga kizuki agete kita yo ni kako no omo sa to sore ni tomona u wareware no sekimu o tankyu shite imasu. 過去の出来事に根ざした作品でありながら登場人物の少女が成長する過程の多感な状況をきめ細かく描かれていることと少女がいかに物語を導いてきたかという点に心を打たれました。この作品の監督は映画という枠の中で彼独自の世界を作り上
and and then uh, I want to thank uh, jury members for selecting the film uh, for the OBIC prize. And it was, I mean, it was re really, really good news. And the whole, the, I mean, our whole team here is super excited uh, for the award. And uh, I think uh, it's kind of a, and if you see this year, the way it is going, you know, and it is kind of a very positive thing happened in all of our lives and with the, all, all the hard work we put for the film. And, and yeah, I mean, I just want to say thank you uh, uh, for organizing such a good festival and giving a platform to the, uh, our small film. And it reached so many people and I have received so many messages and emails from many, many people in America. And I'm really, really happy about, uh, I'm, I'm feeling really happy about whatever is happening, what happened with the film, I mean, yeah. So thank you once again, all the jury members for taking out time to watch the film properly and, and understanding it. Uh, yeah, that's all. And on the behalf of the whole team, I want to say, uh, Thank you once again the, to the Japan Society, Japan Kurtz, and the jury members. Arigato <laughs> gozaimasu. Thank you, Anshul, and thank you to our jury members. Uh, we'll say goodbye to you uh, now. Um, Julian san, Momoko san, Yuki san, thank you very much. And now we'll move on to uh, the Q&A portion uh, of this event. So thank you again for joining us. Thank you very much. So Anshul, again, thank you for joining us and congratulations again. Um, so we're doing a kind of uh, unusual uh, experiment, experimental Q&A. Uh, well, all three of us will kind of join you for uh, formal conversational style Q&A. It's new for us. So we'll okay. try not to uh, step on each other's toes too much. We have some of our own questions. Uh, we have some questions that we're asking on behalf of the jury members. And then we have some questions that came in from online audience submissions. So we'll try to get to as many as we can in the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, Joel, Joel, why don't you start us off? Sure. Uh, so really excited to hear uh, your, your thoughts and insights on the film. Um, so director Obayashi was very interested in lessons from World War II and these multi-generational connections. Uh, and you're of course a much younger filmmaker, um, but you uh, appear to be so interested in uh, so many of the same questions, the legacies of past wars uh, and connections between generations. Uh, and I'm just wondering what uh, led you to pursue this subject uh, in Kontoro? Okay. I mean, I have always been interested in the, the military and the army themes. And it, it also comes from my family background because my father and grandfather, they both were in army. And I also studied in military academy. So I'm really influenced by anything happen, happening around in and around army. And I read a lot of news about all this about all these things happening. And I really, I mean, before making Contoro, I actually, uh, since I am from Military Academy and I wanted to always make a film around that subject or like what actually happens in Academy and also, I actually originally wrote a script based uh, in, uh, it was the script was based on one of the incident I read in, a, in the newspaper about a guy who uh, hanged himself in a hotel after running out from the Yokosuka Academy, Naval Academy here in Japan. So, and, and one of the producers asked me that he want to help me to make the film, but after reading the script, he kind of disappeared. He said, I can't do this. It's like an anti-government is there, so I'm all right. And in that film, there was a particular scene about uh, the, the digging sequence was in that film. And this scene is, was so important for me to film in 2018. I, I thought I have to shoot this scene anyhow. So just to make that film, I. And just to make that scene, I wrote like the whole Pontora, which I could uh, make by myself in the very, very limited budget. So yeah, and so this is what kind of, and, and also the scene is, uh, is, is uh, based on real stories from my family background and what my grandfather did 
Yeah, so basically I am coming from the military background and that's why I was interested in uh, exploring this theme in the film. Hmm. Yeah. I see, yeah, that's very interesting. I think the casting choice of Juan Marley is extremely uh, effective. Can you talk a little bit about how you chose to cast her and what it was like uh, leading, directing her? Oh, okay, Juan Maru, yeah, yeah, she's a really good actress. Uh, so first I met Juan Maru in, I think, 2017, just after I finished the production of my first, or uh, shooting my first film. I met her in uh, with another, Eiji Uchida-san and me and Juan Maru and another actor uh, from Bad Boy Tokyo. We all went for drinking and all. So she was that time, I think, 18 years old. And she just came from Osaka and she didn't know, she wanted to become an actress. And I, I, that time I just realized oh, she has a very strong face and I would love to cast her someday, but I didn't talk to her much. And I, I, then we forgot, we didn't talk to each other. And then when I wrote this film, I was talking about uh, these Yokosuka based Academy film. That time I called in, called her for the auditions and she, she came in for one of the characters audition. And then this, that film didn't, you know, I mean, I couldn't make that film. So I was like, okay, so, and I also forgot about one at the time, but while writing Kuntal, I just could not, I just, her face keep appearing to me. I was like, all right. So, so I started to do Photoshop's like without telling her, like, I think she also don't know that, that, and these goggles, I was, I just wanted to see somebody's face with the goggles looks extraordinary <laughs> and all. And so that's how I started to develop her characters. And now, and I started to check her pictures more and more. Then I started to meet her, you know, and I, 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 I had some, uh, good talk with her she came home also and we talked we talked and slowly slowly even though i she never worked before in this big uh, you know as a main lead character she only did some extra roles or something but somehow i somehow i was very confident that she can and she has she's from osaka so she's very kind of very strong personality she has and i wanted to just pull that out in the film yeah first day of the shooting was very hard for both of us because and we only only did like one day rehearsal actually for the film with one or two days i think we had yeah because for rehearsal you have to book another place and all so then all these things happen and so yeah uh, first day the scene when grandfather passes away and she's expressing herself and all so that day i was like like what's happening I, i'm not getting what i want and she was she couldn't do what she wanted and all but slowly slowly i mean we i think i think second or third day the day she was digging in the forest you know first day when she goes out she started to dig and that day I think she completely become Sora. While she was digging, I was kind of, I started to behave with her like a military man kind of commanding her from behind a tree. I was standing behind a tree and Max, a cinematographer was standing on the, uh, on the hill and it was kind of a deep uh, area in the forest. So she was alone there and she was digging, digging, digging and she just got so frustrated because I was pushing her, pushing her. So she just took out her jacket and her bag and all threw away and she just went into it. After that, she was just, after I said cut and she was just trembling so hard and she couldn't breathe properly. And after that, she was like, oh, okay, okay, I should not use this word. Like, fuck it, like, I'll do it. Like, just bring it on anything. And I was so happy after that. After that, it went all smooth with her. Yeah. And also after that, we ended up doing so many impro improvised scenes and, and she was really comfortable with it. Yeah. Yeah. Another of the really remarkable performances is from Hide Masa Mase who plays the backward walking man. Yeah. Um, of course, everyone's going to ask you, I mean, I don't know how much you want to talk about this character. He seems to represent many things, uh, yeah, yeah. but I'm curious about where the idea came from and how you directed him uh, to behave. Uh, yeah, so uh, before, uh, before anything, this film was supposed to be a bit on the romantic side. Uh, which I completely removed when I found out he's also an artist. I was like, all right. Before that, actually, I was I was about to cast somebody else. But then I heard, I saw his Instagram page. He made caricatures and all. I was like, okay, I should meet him. So I was I was planning a way to represent these war scenes. And of course, I don't don't have I didn't have budget, you know, to make these big scenes and all. And I also come from animation and art backgrounds. So and when I found it, he's an artist. I was really really curious. So I met him. I I called him to my home and we talked. So that's how, and he's the one who made the art in the film also, the, the diary. So that's how we started working on the character that he would come every day to my, or not every day, every weekend to my house. And I will tell him, okay, on this page, you have to make this and you have to write this, this, this. So idea was to put him 
inside the diary himself, like slowly, slowly. So he will go back home, he will make it, he send me the pictures, how what do you think? And we revise over the drawings and all. So so slowly, slowly we end up making a diary, which was, we just finished just before, one day before the shoot. And for his character, I mean, of course he didn't understood. I didn't tell them the meaning behind blocking that word. I told them, you don't need to know. So he, he even though he wanted me to, uh, to tell him why I'm doing this, what is the meaning of the character? I said, you don't have to know. And you will know at the right moment in the film, which he did while shooting the film, which I wanted that happen. But he started, so I, he had only like 12, 15 days to prepare physically. So he start eating like very less and he lost like 12, 10 to 12 kgs in like 10 days. And he was practicing walking backwards in Kamedo. And he, when I was calling my home, he was coming backwards from the station to my home also. He did a lot of rehearsals for that. Yeah, and about the theme of backward walking, I mean, it was, of course, it has so many meanings that it's, it's hard to put in words. And I mean, it's like, for me, it's hard to articulate anything like why like why I'm making the film. So that, that is one of the reasons that I'm making the film, you know, it's because I cannot say those or write those things down. Mm-hmm. I mean, yeah, but I saw one YouTube video and the guy is from Derby, UK. And from because of his mental condition, he walks backwards. You can find that on YouTube, his video. He's a very famous guy. So after I watched the video, I was like, okay, what is this? And never saw this before. And I was so pissed off because of the producer. And I, the, I, was like, I want to make a character who never made before. Like nobody had ever made before. So I did a lot of research and I found out nobody actually made a character who walked backwards. Like literally, it's, it's like a weird character. Nobody does that. So I purposely, I wanted to write the character. So that's how I ended up writing this character and putting all the layers of army background, the art thing, and my personal uh, feelings about filmmaking and as an artist, so everything I just... So whenever I was directing him, I was telling him to, uh, on the emotional level, you have to be this high, this low, and that's how. But I usually leave actors really, really free and let them do whatever they want. And and so I just tell them what I don't want. I never tell them what I want, kind of. So they keep doing it, doing it. Say, no, no, don't do this. Let, let's go on the same way. And same thing with the cinematographer uh, also. I don't disturb when they are like, I, I don't tell them what, I just tell them, don't do this, that's all. But whatever they do, I'm okay with that. Yeah, I, I, I wanted to follow up because you mentioned that, you know, you work and you, as an animator on top of yeah. being a filmmaker. And one of the just questions from the jury was, uh, how does your experience uh, with uh, working in animation influence this film? Uh, or does it at all? Is it completely separate? You, you mentioned uh, the collaboration a little bit with Masse and his ability to draw. Yeah, yeah, I mean, definitely in... The thing is, in in animation, everything is pre-planned. Like every single frame is, you have to make every single frame to you know, like, to move the characters. And it's animator's job to put life into these dead characters. You know, so it, it's a lot of body language and acting comes into play. I mean, animators deal with a lot of body language and acting. So I'm, I'm very inter- I'm I'm very really interested in exploring body body language uh, subject. I read a lot of lot about it and watch a lot of criminal videos and all behavior science and all those things. So I'm really interested in that. So that's the only thing which I take from my animation thing in is. But otherwise, I want to go completely opposite in filmmaking because animation is everything is so much planned and it, you cannot move here and there. And it's like a already edited thing. There is hardly an editor on the on board in the animation industry. Uh, they just put the whole film together, that's it. But they don't cut the scenes. Scenes are cut already when we get the actor's voiceover and the storyboard and the, uh, uh, what do you call that, layout and all those things. So in the filmmaking, I just want to go opposite. I don't want to plan anything. I just I just want to discover things on the go. And so, yeah. But yeah, the sense of uh, sense of framing and all those things, yeah, because I also do a lot of uh, camera animation and all. I have I did it for many, many years. Uh, so yeah, there's there's a sense of of camera and all those things. Yeah, mm-hmm. so it helps a little bit. Yeah. So this is your uh, second feature after yeah. Bad this Pony. Yeah. Second feature. Yeah. And I'm curious, you know, not only what you learned from uh, your work in animation, uh, but what you learned from uh, your uh, first experience uh, making a live action uh, film that you applied here in Contora. Oh, first experience was really, I was like, 
every day I was like shitting my pants basically. I was like really, really panicking because uh, I never, I did some short films with like one or two actors like that. They're very small, like one room, you know, one location kind of. But when it, when I actually have to move around, you know, in a car, rent, rent go to rental house, bring load all the stuff, go there, do this, deal with the police and all. It's, and actors ask questions, you know, like, oh, so why I'm doing this? Why am I, I was like, I was, like, I was really, really, uh, then I realized it's not a, it's not a joke to make a film. So that's what I also learned from the first film. Also, the main thing which I took from the first films, like I did so many mistakes. I, seriously, I did so many mistakes, which I keep telling people that it's not a perfect film and I don't like my first film at all because I know what the mistakes I did in it. I tried to compromise in some way. Oh, oh it's fine. Let's forget it. So in the second film, even though we, did, we had so much less time i was planned better than the first i did better planning in my mind and my own planning my personal planning with the shots and and dialogues and whatever and also i tried not to compromise that much even though we end up compromising a lot but i tried to achieve what i wanted to achieve even though there are many many compromises and also i learned better way to tell uh, in a good way to tell actors what i want which was very hard for me in in the, in the first film uh, so I also learned like never don't never say like nothing to the actor you have to say something to them so mostly about directing actors and all because my communication with my cinematographer is pretty good uh, we both are on the same page almost all the time it's sometimes here and there it, it happens like you know, with cinematographer and directors are like couples so the fights keep happening but it's fine it's, it's for the creative changes so it's not a big issue but the only thing is to like uh so for Contra, I also I wanted to, it to look more beautiful as so a placement and a staging of the actor who is who is going when who is doing this. So I focus more on that. And in the first film, first film it was like whenever I'm confused, I will just steal the camera. It's like the basic rule I follow. If I'm really con I don't know what to do, everything should be still because I don't know how to move the camera. The camera should be still, actor should be still, and just say the lines. But in second film, I move the camera a lot. I mean, there's a lot of tracking shots, a lot of follow shots, and all those. Yeah, so we played with the camera a lot. So yeah, and I also learned from this film many, many mistakes which I did, which I will improve in the next film. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, I encourage audiences to to seek out Bad Poetry Tokyo. I know it's available streaming through other means uh, in the in so the Amazon Prime and Vimeo right now. Yeah, and also in theaters in Japan. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and both films, just kind of drawing a few connections. Uh, both films involve young women um, who are kind of breaking out of small towns or have already broken out of small towns. Um, there's also the kind of commonality of the three people playing in the water. Um, I'm wondering just what draws you to these narratives of kind of breaking out of the small rural space. And like, yeah. I, mean, I mean, story, okay, story also comes from the locations I get and I, I only know Tokyo very well. And then in this, in Kontora, we had the Seke city which is a beautiful town. So, I mean, this is the, and also it, comes because I never write a film and then cast. I don't want to do that. I try not to do that. I usually fix the actors in my head and while writing, I keep them in my head. So somehow I had all my trust in one Marie, even though she didn't know that I was writing for her till long time. I just told her like a few months before. So yeah, I mean, and at the same time, I mean, one of the thing, theme which is similar is like the mother mother is missing both the films. So it, it also comes from a point of view because while writing, I don't want to be fake because before I used to think, okay, I should write very philosophical stuff, this and that. Then I felt like this is stupid and this is not me. I should just write what I know in real life, what I what I can write, the characters I can write basically. So I realized I, I still cannot write mother characters somehow it's really hard for me to put dialogues into mother characters. So I'm like, okay, I just remove them from the film. <laughs> so so it, it comes like that also. And so in both the film, this river scene uh, is kind of, uh, I actually, I didn't realize when I was doing in Contra that it was kind of similar also in the first film. But in one, one time while shooting, I want to let actors free completely. Like I tell them, be Wan Marui or be Mase or be Yamada. Don't be your characters in the film. I want you to be yourself as you are in the outside world and do whatever what the hell you want to do in these shots and, and but i just tell them basic thing you have to do this you have to do this and now go and no cuts nothing so we just start playing and so while we were shooting those scenes i was just telling shouting okay now now do this now do that in in the middle because there were no dialogues in there so i don't need to keep 
in mind about editing and all those things. So they are there. I just wanted them to have fun uh, on in those sequences and just because after those scenes, very crazy scenes were coming. So I was like, okay, let out whatever you have inside. And at the night time was the birthday scene and the crazy, the one of my favorite scenes of one movie. And so I was like, okay, you just, whatever fun you want to have, this just having this scene and let's get serious after this. Yeah. Well, you mentioned your nighttime scenes, but can you describe a little bit about your choice to not shoot in black and white, but to make it black and white in post and the nighttime scenes as well? Nighttime scenes, as in the scenes outside in the forest, or yeah. Uh, okay, yeah. So uh, when I was writing the film and researching the pictures from World War and all those times, it was always in my mind the film was black and white. Always, I mean, I had a huge collection of pictures and all which I collected, uh, which I wanted to put in the diary. So it was all, the image was always black and white, and also Max, uh, my cinematographer, and we have been talking. We actually tried to make my first film into black and white in the post, but somehow we didn't do that. But we said, okay, this is the chance and this is the, this is the right story to do that also, because it's it's kind of a dedication uh, to the World War and the like grandfathers and all who fought. And that time when you, I mean, I saw many documentaries, they were all in black and white. So all the inspiration was uh, coming from the, the black and white sources. So we did shoot film in color, but uh, my my monitor never, I told them I don't want to see color. So I always saw black and white. Yeah, so so it's easy to make decisions uh, while shooting. Otherwise, if it's a, we are shooting in the, we shot, I mean, in camera, of course, it's recorded in color, but the output was black and white. So in post, yeah, also, then Max did a great job in color grading to make it more, uh, put more feelings into that. And he's a, professional color grading artist. So he's really, really good. He's one of the top artists here. And I'm lucky to work and to have him as a both cinematographer and because he can see what's a mistake he's doing so that we can fix that in the post or so it's kind of connected. So it's also easier that way. Mm -hmm. uh, the night scene, actually the jungle scene is a, uh, is a lunchtime scene, is a evening scene, but the, the forest was so dense that even in the daytime there was no light, like hardly and that's kind of one of the regrets I have that in that scene, it, it was supposed to match with the outside when uh, Tai Chi and Mara's character were driving the car to find the daughter, you know? So, yeah, but it's uh, it's all right. We wanted to be more natural also, not to look it very fake. So we hardly use any lights also. We, we just went with natural sources and all. Only one or two scenes have lights we used. Yeah. I see. Yeah, and can you talk a little bit more about what you just said about the location and Forest and how, what circumstances brought you to shoot in that location in Seki? Uh, yeah, okay. So, so the lo location is a very uh, small, uh, beautiful town called Seki City, uh, Sekishi in Gifu. So, this is the hometown of the actor Taichi Yamada, who played the father of Sora. So, while writing the film, uh, before writing the film, I met him, and he previously worked in my first film as a small character, the bar owner. And so we were talking, so he want, he was, he was wanted to work, we wanted to work together and all. So I said, okay, if you wanna act, because I told him, I don't know, I don't have producers and anybody, so I cannot write a film the way I want and then hunt for the locations or, you know, find producers to find my film. I already failed in pitching one of the films before this. I don't wanna go into another script, finding out that it's, it's not gonna happen. So I told him, if you give me your hometown and the locations, show me around first and if I get inspired, then I will write the film. So he he said, okay, come come my home. And we took his car. We, dr we drove from Tokyo to Seiki City. And he sh and when we was entering the, uh, the village, first thing I saw was the cliff, which is in the end of the film. And I wrote the ending right away. Like, this is it. I, I, have, I have my film, right? The ending of the film was fixed that moment. Then I saw the cliff, which we show in the end of the film. Yeah, then he brought me to his house and all the rooms. And we noted when the light comes in, all those like technical bar. Then he showed me his sister's uh, carpenter shop, his grandfather's carpenter shop, which nobody's using, is abandoned. So it, it has a great source of light in the daytime, like beautiful light comes in, I was like, wow, okay. So I, I kept taking pictures and he took his two temples and the river and his friend's factory. They make aluminum, uh, they, the, what do you call that? Uh, die cast factory of aluminum. So all these places which belongs to his friends and his family. So I just took pictures and I wrote down some briefs and all, and I went back home 
and I told him I will come back to you after two, three months or something. So I started to think about the subject and all. Then I sit down for the writing one day and within a week I had the whole script ready and I told them, okay, I want to go back with Max now. So I took Max next time. Then Max brought his camera and all and we did test shoot in all the locations roughly like how it's going to look like, which and like uh, uh, aspect ratios and all those things, technical part. And we also met local villagers and all and some of them, we made them agree to be part of the film as extras and all those things, yeah. Then we came back and we started the rehearsal process for a few days and then we just finalized the 10 days. Everybody took off from their job. <laughs> we just went there and shot the film and came back, yeah. You mentioned before about watching these, uh, I, guess, I assume newsreels about World War II or were these uh, fiction films. Uh, you know, the, the film seems to have so many um, visual references that remind me of other films. I, and I wonder if you had any direct influences or if there were any cinematic references that were important uh, for you. Uh, no, I think only thing I, actually I didn't watch any color film while writing a before. I said, I, I will only watch black and white films if I want to watch for any, uh, and usually while thinking about the film and writing the film, I never watch film because in some way it might influence or something like that. So I always watch films after finishing the script. The script was done. So mostly I I watched Belatar's films, uh, The Terrain Horse and Santan Tango and all those films I watched and also told Max that, and I always share with my film, the music I listen to while writing and the films I'm watching. I always keep saying, okay, I'm listening to this right now. I'm in this mood. So for this mood, I'm listening to this. For this mood, I'm listening to this. So I mostly listen to so many uh, musicians, uh, like composers from Europe and Hungary and all from Russia, mostly. And then I watched uh, the full length documentary, which just released at that time on Netflix, uh, The Vietnam War. It was in color though, but previously I have watched a bit of bits and pieces in black and white also. So I watched the whole film just to get in the mood of, even though we are not showing the war actually in the film, which I was not capable of doing so, but I just wanted, I just do things around the film only. I don't want to go out. So same thing I sent to Juan and Masse also. Okay, watch this. Don't think anything, just watch, just get into it, the mood of it, that's it. Yeah, so. <clears throat> Yeah, that, that's all. I forgot the question already, sorry. <laughs> no, no, that's that's great. We uh, we were taking bets on if Bellatar was a direct reference or not. So really? I, was, I, I was happy to hear it, yeah. Yeah, I, I also keep sending the image of uh, Santan Tango's girl who's walking, you know, to... Yeah. Uh, I mean, yeah. if you see my, if you see the initial pitches of the film, I mean, the pitch doc, which I made to show to my team, mm -hmm. this is the visual reference. So that girl's face is the biggest. It was also in my wall on above my desk while I was writing all the time. So I told Juan, look at the honesty and you know, innocence in her eyes and you know, things like that. And, and I always told her, she's not an actress. This director just found her and they cast it. So when you act, don't think about, you know, any pressure of acting or acting or you have to act. Don't think like that, be yourself, you know, and, the, and we will work around and we play around and see what happens. So yeah. Great. Uh, so this film, uh, Kontora, screened in Japan Cut's new section dedicated to independent films and uh, emerging or early career directors. Uh, how do you feel about the current state of independent filmmaking and you know, what needs to change? You know, what uh, inequities have been revealed because of the COVID-19? In uh, Japan, you mean? Or... Uh, in, in Japan or uh, elsewhere in the kind of independent? Yeah, I mean, yeah, yeah, I mean I, I'm more familiar uh, with Japan, so I'll talk about here. But yeah, in general, I think, uh, I don't know. I mean, it's hard to like, you know, when you become the part of the filmmaking community, it's hard to comment also on the same time. Mm. Um, the thing is, uh, indie film industry is, it's easy to like, uh, uh, I mean, it's easy to make films here. It's not hard. If you really want to make film here, it's easy. First, because of the, because Japan don't have like unions like SEG after I know. I mean, I should not say that, but that's the truth. I mean, you can get actors on cheap and all, mm -hmm. you know, so it's, if you're a new director, you want to make a film, if you don't have much money, you can easily make a film. 
that's not a big problem. The problem comes when the film's finished here. You know, the problem comes in the distribution system. Uh, mm. That's what I personally felt. Distribution system is, it, it sucks here. Like, it's hard to like go to people to show the film and get the distributors and then distributors, once the distributors comes on board, if you're lucky, otherwise you just have to hire a PR, which you have to certain money, which might be more than the money you put in the film, you know, and then he will be able to hardly book one theater or maximum two theater and the film will die forever after that nobody will nothing will happen few <laughs> films like which is supported by companies like i don't know third window films or something like that they reach out more you know so yeah it, it's good that company like that exists so that they support film indie filmmakers but usually i know so many filmmakers they make films and they do a limited screening of like maybe even three or four days or maybe even one day you know they book the theater and they show and and you can see the pain in that because everybody's dream is to you know, show their film on a bigger screen and everybody, and you want the houseful audience. It's also to get inspired on a, on a personal level as a director. But that's what I feel here, the main problem in indie filmmaking industry. I mean, even if I say there's not much support, it won't be right because why would anybody would support? It's their money. They, they can choose to not support or not support, but yeah. It's not hard to make film, first of all, but the main problem comes in the distribution system here, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, uh, in theater and distribution system, because if I want to get bigger theater, I, I cannot do that because they are controlled by certain lobbies, you know, like that, because you cannot, you can't even dream of putting a film into bigger theater. You just have indie theaters and, do, and during the corona time and theaters were closed down, every theater have two to three employees working in them. And there are so many of them. And my own film was running in the theater at the time when the theaters closed down. And then they started a campaign of uh, save, save the Cinema, which went very, very well. And I'm really happy that so many people have supported them. So at least they can survive for a few months until the films are uh, you know, a bit better, until, until the things are a bit, bit better and run normally. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so that's... Uh, that's the thing, but I still, on a bigger level, I feel a huge difference in Japanese indie films and the indie films elsewhere in the world. It, I'm also talking about the quality of the films here and also the subjects people pick. I mean, I'm not, I'm not Japanese and it's very weird to talk about this subject because I, I kind of belong to in a smaller level. But I also feel like the new directors here who just come out of the colleges, they are not hitting the right subject. I don't know why the same subjects are being repeated here. Mm. For example, use of uh, this kawaii culture, the use of school girls and making the love stories around them. There are millions of films. Why? That's why I wanted to use a school girl and use it, use her into opposite direction. Use, I wanted her to explore the history rather than to romance to somebody, you know, like, and all like beautiful things, you know, like, all these things. So I have, I, I cannot say I, I have a problem with this thing. Of course, it's anybody's uh, choice to make any film, but as a, as a whole, as an industry, I'm saying they should challenge themselves more because there are so many crazy subjects to be made in Japan. Like literally nobody's touching. Nobody's mm-hmm. touching those subjects. There are so many of them. You can just pick up any newspaper and I mean, usually people think Japan is a very peaceful country, no crime happens, but just go to the crime page and you see what kind of things are happening here. So I read a lot of news and all, so I usually go to opposite direction and I don't, I don't, I cannot make a film uh, where I feel I'm not being honest and write a character which I don't relate with on a personal level. So I just, I just feel if all the, the new directors especially are making some really uh, good subjects, speaking of good subjects, there, then there could be a kind of new wave happening here. Otherwise, I don't see it happening anytime soon. Where everybody is doing the same subject. You can just name it, Yakuza, Samurai, and Kawaii Girls, School Girls, Love Story. That, that, that's it. That, or some kind of horror films. That's it. Mm. Yeah, more realistic stories should be made more. That's what I feel about uh, maybe this is an appropriate segue to uh, get to some audience questions. Um, speaking about the subject of filmmaking, um, this audience member wants to know how you got the financing of your, of your film. Um, you know, it's been said that you shot the film in ten days, 
So I was wondering um, what was your camera setup? It looks like a million bucks and you achieved such quality <laughs> so quickly. Uh, any advice for crafting uh, minimalist films uh, for uh, aspiring filmmakers? Okay. Uh, first of all, I'm myself an aspiring filmmaker. I don't think I'm, I mean, I mean I'm just, I just made it, but still I, I have so much to learn. But yeah, thanks for the question. I mean, the budget came in the budget is so less that I mean, I can't even say that it's kind of embarrassing. It's really cheap budget, but I'm happy that team came together and they agreed to work on that budget. But I, as I was working in Studio Attic at that time, when I was thinking of the filming and one day my office party was going on my and my CEO of the company was drunk. So I called the producer of the animation project. I said, come here and go and tell him that I need money for the film. Just like that, I said randomly. And he actually went to him and he said, why, he, he started abusing on the CEO, like in, in a funny way, he's a funny guy. He said, why this guy, he made already one film and he's working in your studio from so for, for five years. Why don't you support him? He was like, okay, how much you want? I was like, what? <laughs> I was like you, are you serious? I told him, please tell me tomorrow morning, you're drunk right now. He said, no, tell me, I will, I will give you right now. I was like, all right. So I told him. So the next day morning and I told him, do you remember? As, like yeah yeah uh, he was forgetting so I, was, I kept pushing him no 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 we talked about this he said all right so he just gave me a little bit of money and so that's why then i found the location of course it's a cost i mean if i have to rent all those locations you know and if i had to rent all those crazy things locations you know big team of course the budget will go really really big i mean would have gone really big but since we got the location for free from yamara sons well, uh, and for like hotel, uh, we didn't stay in hotel. We everybody slept in three rooms in Jamal Hassan's house. One room was all male members, one were all female members, one was uh, the senior members kind of thing. Jamal Hassan, senior son, and uh, his team. So that's how we slept in the uh, in the house. And morning we wake up, we make breakfast, and everything we kept like a homely, like a very tight. And also there are not many characters in the film, so it was easier that way. About the camera setup, it's the same. Uh, uh, the, so the Max owns the camera, and uh, and 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 the lenses and all everything. He owns it, so we didn't have to rent the uh, camera equipments. And same thing with the Rob, the sound recording guy. He also owns all his equipments, and we agreed to work on certain fees. I said, okay, if, if you're not comfortable, you're always uh, free to say no. You can't do that. So they agreed. So I said, okay, let's do this then. And yeah, that's how we shot. And and the quality of the film also came out from the choice of uh, the location we did, which has a good natural lights and all. I mean, of course, if you're making a film on a minimum budget and a minimum scale, you you have to be smart. I mean, also at the same time, how to use the location in your benefit to not, it actually look, look like a really cheap film, you know? you. So yeah, also Max is a really good cinematographer, you know, in, in that way. And also he is a color grading artist. So the finished product is, looks very nice. And overall, uh, the feeling, emotions from the film also comes from Yuma Koda, the musician of the, the composer of the film, which, which one of my friends introduced me to him in a bar. And uh, he is like really, really talented. So I started to, and he is mostly inspired by cinema also in general. So it was very easy to work with him and I left him completely free, like do whatever you want to do it. Some, and I also brought him to the location after the shoot was finished. Uh, everything was finished. I brought him one day for two days in Seki City and explored the, so I told him, okay, I shot my film in this location. I shot in this, this is the grandfather I shot. And we made him sing some songs and ask about the stories from World War. And he was recording everything. Yuma was recording everything. We went to the river, the mountain, he recorded. He just got inspired by the atmosphere and then he just closed himself maybe for one or two months while I was doing the editing, he was making the music. And then when he, he, he sent back to me one batch, then second batch, the third batch was almost final and we just tweaked a little bit, but yeah, that's how we end up making the whole film in a very, very uh, small budget, like a, like a family. Yeah. And, and, and everybody took, uh, part in the production like for example uh, we didn't have like you know dolly and grips and all that so yamara san had this van a small car so he was the driver between his takes so he was driving us 
you know, uh, and the, Max is sitting on the top of the truck and uh, I was holding him and the Peter, the second AC, uh, the first AC of the film who was doing the follow focus, uh, he was doing the follow focus. And one day before the film started, our follow focus broke down, no, not working. So he did everything by, because it, before it was remote follow focus, it broke down. He was doing everything by hand. So we all three were on the top of the car. I, I was telling, like bumping on the car, okay, slow down fast, slow down fast. And that's how, we made the whole film literally like this, like run and shoot, run and shoot, run and shoot, literally. And also uh, the longer shots were designed uh, to show that the production can be finished fast. So one take long shot. Otherwise, if you take like action here, then reaction this, that, it, it gets very long. So the shots, shots I designed was around that. Okay, we have to take one takes as much as possible. So in editing also is very smooth, just pick and just drop it there, kind of, yeah. All good advice, I think. Um, just one more brief audience question. We, you know, we know that the war is obviously uh, important to this film, but this viewer is wondering if there are any other bits of Japanese history or folklore uh, that served to, that inspired any part of the film. Uh, not really. I mean, even though the uh, character, I didn't. I mean, I did not tell or did not portray in the. Uh, I mean. How does, I, I did not clearly mention in the film who the actually he is. I left many, many notes. From the starting, in the moment he enters the film, you can see him happy kind of thing. So it's like a coming back to something he belonged to before for me. And there are many, many gestures, small, small places I left uh, suggestions like to audience to pick also. Uh, also the, 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 sing, the songs he was singing is not Japanese. He made it up, all, all of them. <laughs> I, because I wanted it to make it look like somebody from another world, kind of, you know, another language, everything. That's how I created this character till the end, till the end when he transforms, you know, like, and people realize, oh, he might be himself, the grandfather himself, something like that. But it's not a folklore, but it's kind of a thing in the Asian culture, not only Japan, also, I think China, India, whatever. I feel like the, the respect to, uh, you know, uh, grandfather and the people who die is a very huge in into their culture is it's like really deep in the culture of in Japan also that was one of the thing uh, to get inspired for that character particular but in in particular there was no folklore kind of thing yeah but in India we do have stories of like a, a ghost or something who walk whose feet are backwards they were uh -huh. like that. So it was, it just came in my head once or twice, but I did not think about that too much. Yeah. Cool. Do you mind sharing with us to the extent that you can, what future projects that you're working on now? Oh yeah, I'm right now, uh, actually I just finished uh, one, one of uh, my third film script. I mean, after Contura, I mean, going to the festivals, I started getting many messages from producers and all of this. I was like, okay, I was suddenly happy, but at the same time, I, I was already into another film, and uh, which I was writing this year in Jan and Feb, and I finished the script and I sent to one lab, and it didn't work out. So I was very sad. But anyway, because of the lockdown happened and a lot of it, 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 it really like it was bad time, it's still going on. But uh, one good thing happened is like I end up changing that script into completely contained environment, which also reflects my own feelings of this situation going on. So I have a script which I just finished the day before yesterday, I, uh, and I will start. Uh, now I'm revising it, so I will start the pre-production pretty soon. But I'm still uh, looking for some kind of help from the financial point of view. But in any way, even though I don't get the finance or whatever it is, I know that I will end up making films because there are some stories which you cannot let go. I mean, I mean. Also, I can only focus in one story. For example, if I have this subject and character stuck in my he head, I really want to make it right now because if I go to another year, I will, I cannot make them because I'm feeling in a certain way about this character right now. So that's that's why I think I will anyway make this film. And it's a contained genre film shot in and around one car only. And it, it's going to be very, very difficult shoot. I know that because there are some car shots in both of my films and it was really, really annoying and irritating to shoot those shots because 
to hook up scenario you have to go back with the car and then shoot again this and it's a lot of sound in the car you know a lot of technical problems so i don't know how the hell i'm going to make this film but i'm interested in the story point and the characters right now so yeah and it, it oh, i forgot to tell it it deals with the the subject which is kind of not explored yet or maybe i don't know is it deals with subjects uh, people who disappeared in japan uh, johatsu and all the all that culture people who uh, hire professionals to make them disappear overnight and change their identity and all so it, the film is about that and street thieves so and mental disability and there are many layers in the film it's it's kind of a thriller so if i can make it that way i don't know it depends <laughs> yeah. wow we we can't wait uh and we we really hope to have you uh, in New York uh, for Japan Cuts physically uh, in the not too distant future. Um, but before we close, uh, I just wanted to ask, uh, you know, from a filmmaker's perspective, uh, what was it like participating in an online uh, film festival uh, like, like this? I know you had a lot of communication through social media yeah. audiences. Yeah, I think even though I really, really wanted to be in New York because first, I'd never been there. And second, uh, I have never seen any film there, even including my short films or first film. It was never, I don't know, somehow no, none of the festivals took it. So I was like, this is the first time actually any of my film was playing uh, in New York. And my whole team was wanted to be there. But anyway, uh, it didn't happen because of Corona, but it went online. And I think there's so many positive things happened because of that, because it reached more audience first and more than it was, it would have been in the physical you know screening because i think so many people watched from throughout the america and i got so many message and emails i was really happy about it so yeah i think it reached more people and also second i think it is good that festivals who are deciding to go online rather than completely shutting off because of corona it i think it's a very good thing that japan's chose to do this uh, you know festival and also in a very interesting way all these like even small small things details like the image of this the the poster and this green background and the kind of sessions like q a and all this is all pretty interesting it's not it's not just basic that i am sure there's a lot of hard work and the big team behind it so yeah i, I really as a filmmaker I, i'm really really happy with whatever happened with kontola in japan cuts mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah so yeah really really um Thanks to the whole team of Japan Cards on behalf of uh, Kontola's team. Yeah. Oh, well, 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 thank you so much, Anshul. Yeah, thank you again. Uh, we're going to wrap here, but um, we really mean it. And we want to bring you to New York uh, at the next opportunity. So we look forward to that. But I hope I can make us make a film which I mean, which can belong to Japan Girls. I don't know if I make a shitty film. I don't know. I, I will never do that. <laughs> we'll talk. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, until then, yeah, please take care. And yeah. we'll say goodbye for now. Yeah, thank you very much for everything. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.